In this video, I will demonstrate how to use SPSS to write up the results of a t-test. One of the more intimidating aspects of producing your own research and doing your own data analysis is how to communicate the results of that analysis and how to communicate the results of testing a certain hypothesis. So in this video, I will attempt to demonstrate how to write a results section that will fit the guidelines for most journals and most applications, uh, whether they be APA, AMA, or specific journals. But I do recommend that you read very closely the, the guidelines for writing results section for whichever application you're going to be writing this for, or whichever situation you're going to be writing it for. So before you begin the actual writing of the narrative of your results section, there's a few things you need to do to help organize yourself. Uh, one of the first things is to gather data that can help you describe your groups. So in the case of doing a t-test, presumably you, you will have two groups in which you will need to describe uh, demographics as well as the outcome measures for each group. So you want to have the data necessary to do that. Within your results section in the narrative, you need to identify the reason for the analysis. In other words, which hypothesis are you testing? You'll need to identify in detail the actual analysis that's been done. And then you'll need to report the results of that analysis. So you might need to indicate if assumptions for the test are met. You'll need to report very specific outputs from that analysis, which includes degrees of freedom, the actual test statistic value, the p-value, and also indicate if the result is statistically significant. Also, for each outcome measure by group, it's important you include the central tendency measure. In this case, it should be the mean. Uh, it also may be the median or the mode, uh, standard deviation, and confidence intervals for each outcome measure. And it's also important you report some sort of effect size and also any other measures you may have of clinical significance that will go along with the statistical significance. What is important to realize as you're, as you're writing the narrative of your results section is this is not the area to offer detailed interpretation of why the results turn out the way they did or why you think uh, the results came out relative to your hypothesis the way they did. It's mostly just to report the results, to report what happened, what data you collected, and what were the results of that analysis. So first let's talk about describing your groups. It's important uh, in most research to be able to describe the characteristics of your subjects, either as a whole or typically by group. So that could include demographic information like age, gender, uh, height, weight, and so on. And it depends on what's important to you in describing your sample uh, or your population. And this is important for replication of research. So if someone is going to try and replicate your study, they need to have a good idea of what your subject demographics look like. So it's important you include the measures of central tendency for each of these characteristics or variables. So for example, for age, that would probably be the mean or maybe the median. For the breakdown of gender, that might be a percentage, or it might be the mode. So it's going to depend on what type of characteristic you're dealing with. It's also important to provide measures of variance for each of these characteristics, standard, standard deviation, or possibly standard error, and also confidence intervals for each of these characteristics, if appropriate. Now this is typically best done with a table, um, and it's extremely important that your reader have something to refer to as you begin to describe your sample and you begin to describe your results, they can have a sense of, of what the outcome measures are for each of the outcomes you might have. So having a table for them to refer to is, is very, very useful because it's very tedious to read um, in a narrative form uh, descriptions of all these different characteristics and all the numbers associated with that. So this is a very good place to use a table. Now where to get most of this information, here's an example of an SPSS output um, showing the descriptives for different groups. Um, for different, uh, for uh, one particular outcome. And so here you'll be able to find your mean, you'll be able to find your confidence intervals, you'll be able to find standard deviation, uh, minimum, maximum, and so on. So this is really where you're going to get the bulk of your descriptive information um, as you describe your sample, as you describe your different outcomes. Okay, and here's an example of what a table may look like in describing some demographics by group. So in this case, we have age and height are two demographics that are interesting to us. So we want to report these by group with a mean and a standard deviation and also a confidence interval uh, 
for each of these demographics. Now the next thing you want to make sure you're going to be able to do in your narrative is to identify the reason for the analysis. And this is where the reader should be able to identify which hypothesis, if you have more than one, goes with which analysis. So remember, every hypothesis should have an analysis associated with it and vice versa. So we want to make sure we're identifying that for, for, you, for our readers. So a couple of examples here. Uh, in order to assess the effect of the treatment on the control group compared to the treatment group, that's our reason for doing the analysis. We want to do a direct comparison between two groups. Or the goal of determining the effect of the treatment over time was realized by performing a dependent samples t-test. So again, we're identifying for the reader uh, why we're doing this particular analysis. And this can be done very, very concisely and very succinctly. Okay, the next element of this is making sure you identify the actual analysis conduct conducted. So do we do a dependent samples t-test? Do we do an independent samples t-test? Did we do a one sample t-test? So we want to make sure that's identified very precisely. And in the first example, you can see I've done that. But we, what we also want to try and do for, in the interest of really helping the reader understand what analysis is being done and what's actually being analyzed, it's important to try and identify what the independent and dependent variables might be. So as we look to these next two examples, we can see I identify the test, but I also identify what the variables are. So an independent samples t-test was performed to compare the blood glucose levels, there's our dependent variable, for the medication and placebo groups, there's our independent variable. And you can see in the, the next example, I, I do the same thing. A dependent samples t-test was performed to evaluate the efficacy of the treatment in reducing anxiety levels, and assuming that would mean over time. So here's an example of how we're able to, again, bring the reader back to uh, understanding what type of analysis we're doing and which variables we're doing for that or using for that analysis. Okay, and, and then the last part and, and probably the most important part is reporting the actual results of the analysis that we did, of the t-test that we're doing. So we, a couple things we want to make sure we're doing, as I mentioned before, we want to indicate if assumptions for the test are met. So we want to indicate specifically what assumptions those might be and then how they were met and if they were met. When we're doing a t-test, we want to make sure we're reporting the degrees of freedom for that t-test, the actual test statistic value, what the t-score was, the exact p-value associated with that t-statistic, and then indicate for your reader if you are using the criteria for statistically significant or non-significant. It's also important we include the mean, standard deviation, and confidence interval for, for each outcome measure by group. And then you may have to do this uh, independently. SPSS won't give you this information, but you may have to then calculate an effect size. And if you've got other measures of clinical significance, like a min minimal clinically important difference value uh, or a clinically significant change score, um, those are also good things to include uh, in your results if you have those available to you. So the output that SPSS gives us gives us the majority of the information that I just mentioned. So for example, if we look at the top table here, we have our group means, um, our group standard deviations for uh, our outcome measure. And then in the independent samples test table, we have uh, Levine's test for equality of variances, which is one of the assumptions of doing a t-test. So we can report whether or not uh, we're able to assume equal variances or not assume equal variances. We have our actual t-score. We have our degrees of freedom. We have our p-value. And then we also have the mean difference between the groups as well as the confidence intervals for that difference. So those are all things that can be included in a result section. And SPSS gives us the majority of that. What we don't have here, as I mentioned before, is we don't have an effect size measure like Cohen's D. Uh, and we also don't necessarily have any measures of clinical significance like uh, MCID. So that's something we may have to, to do some additional calculation to, to gather. So how do we put all this together and write this up? Well, I've got a couple of examples of how we can do that. So as you look through this example, um, you can see, first of all, in the first sentence, 
we indicate um, what analysis is being done and what variables are being done and, and why it's being done. So the reason for the analysis is also included in that very first sentence. So we can see that uh, we get a lot done in just one sentence. We answer those first three points that I mentioned in the first sentence. The next sentence, we identify the assumptions for doing a t-test and whether or not we met them. And also we can include a criteria for why we decided they were met. And then in the next uh, sentence, we indicate whether or not there was a significant difference between the two groups. And then we identify uh, the mean score uh, for each group as well as the variance, the standard deviation for that, for the male and female group. We indicate the t-score as well as degrees of freedom. And here's the actual t-score and then the actual p-value associated with that. And it's also a good thing to include uh, whether or not you've done a one-tail versus a two-tail test. Oftentimes we assume we're doing a two-tail test, but if we've done a one-tail test, we want to make sure we indicate for our reader that we've done that. And then the last sentence gets into talking about the effect size. So we talk about the magnitude of the difference in the means. Uh, we give the actual mean difference. We give the confidence intervals, and then we give a effect size measure, uh, Cohen's D in this, in this case. So here's an example of an independent t-test of how we take all that information and put it into a, um, a very explicit, very uh, informative paragraph. And here's an example for a paired samples or dependent samples t-test. So again, we can see much the same thing that we attempt to do um, in the first sentence. We're giving the reason why we're doing it. We're indicating the, the outcome. Then in the next line, we're giving whether or not we have a statistically significant change. We're giving the means for the pretest, the means for the post-test, as well as the standard deviation for those two groups of scores. We're giving the actual t-score, degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom of 29. Here's the actual t-score. Here's our p-value, and again, whether or not we're doing a one- or two-tailed test. We can again give some idea of the magnitude of the difference. So the mean decrease in BMI was 2.27 with a 95% confidence interval. In this case, we have a clinically important change value, or we're assuming we do. So two units would be a clinically important change. So we want to identify the fact that our mean change exceeded that clinically important change level. And then we can lastly give a measure of the magnitude of, of the effect using Cohen D. Now, explaining why these results turned out the way they did, that's for our discussion section. But what we've been able to do here in these two examples is, as I mentioned before, give a very explicit detail of why we're doing the analysis, what the analysis was, what were the actual results, and then the basic interpretation of those results relative to statistical as well as clinical significance. So hopefully this is helpful for you. Uh, in being able to begin to design and write your own re result sections. So hopefully you're able to learn something from this video, and good luck using this uh, for your own research.